When the last vestiges of her shield spell failed, Ashara shrieked as the waters overwhelmed her. In the background, she heard other cries as well, her handmaidens, the guards, and the rest of the highborn who still served her. The well filled her lungs, but she did not drown. We have two different narratives of what happened as the waters flooded the palace, dragging Ashara into the fathomless depths of the maelstrom. The first comes from the War of the Ancients novels, which is still mostly respected as the canon material. In the novels, Ashara is still seated in her palace when she hears the whispers. She holds the shield almost effortlessly, sat still, only beginning to break a sweat. She responds to the voices while still holding her wine cup. The voices make the offer through echoed whispers. There is a way. You will become more than you ever were. We can help. You will be more than you ever have been. She nods her head in acceptance, and her body is immediately racked with pain. She felt her limbs twisting, curling. Her spine felt fluid, as if much of it had instantly melted away. As she drops her empty wine cup on the floor, the whispers speak again. And when the time comes, for what we will grant you, you will serve as well. Unable to concentrate on the spell any longer, as she contorts and writhes in pain, the ward against the water breaks. In the game, we are offered a slightly different, but more detailed vision of the past. The memory is extracted and left there by the queen herself for the heroes to discover, so it can be taken with a pinch of salt. This story of the pact, as Ashara offers it to us, begins with her outside of the palace on the city streets. She creates the ward to hold back a wave as it comes down on her and her subjects. She is straining against the pressure of the water when she hears the voices telling her to let go. Let go. <sighs> No! I am queen. This is the empire I built. It is over. She refuses and exclaims her exalted position as queen and the glory of her empire. The ward breaks and she is pulled into the sea. As she drowns, she is haunted by the ghostly wails and corpses of her subjects confused and angry that her deal with Sargeras wasn't honoured. She then begins to hear and converse with the singular voice, who explains to her the offer. Hmm. For a thousand years, bound beneath these waves, I have watched you. I have tasted your essence. You. It won't be long now. Your death is near. Only I can sustain you. The voice was an old god, one of the four gigantic sprawling entities imprisoned in deep chambers within Azeroth. The Old Gods ruled before the Night Elves, before the Trolls, having taken over the land from the Elementals in primordial times. They were dark, malefic monstrosities whose roots lay deep in the land, forever bound with Azeroth. When the land split open during the Sundering, it was the Old God Nazoth who called to the Elven Queen and offered her salvation in return for servitude. Serve me. You? You are nothing. Nothing? <laughs> I am a god! Before you walked this land, I ruled. Uh. Magnificent. Serve me, and we will rebuild my Not a slave. You've watched me for a thousand years, so you know what I want. Take my people. With them, I will raise an army. Come
conquer your enemies, build an empire as queen. Or let me die, and you will remain here, a prisoner, the god of nothing. <laughs> Ashara would make the deal, but only on her terms. She would not be a servant, she would remain a queen. She would offer up her people and work to free the old god from its bonds, but only as a ruler by its side. Either that, or, she proposed, the god could stay imprisoned. By its boon, Ashara's body began to twist into a vile form, her appearance finally reflecting the wickedness and malice that had always hidden within her core, though her face retained some of her elven beauty still. Sacrificing her people, cursing them with the same fate, her highborn transformed along with her. They became a new race, the serpentine Naga, with Ashara as their queen. She swam down into the dark abyss of the ocean, with her new army of cold-blooded subjects, to build a new empire and continue with her plan to remake and rule over a new world. Arise, Ashara! Arise, my queen! <laughs> In Ajara's retelling, the queen was on the streets with her people when the floods began. She shielded her subjects from a great wave and courageously refused to drop the ward despite the overwhelming pressure of the water. Only after she was dragged into the sea did she begin speaking to the old god, and only after negotiating herself a role as queen by his side, rather than a general in service to him, did she make the pact. In the novels, Ashara agrees to accept help from the voices before the waters flood the palace at the very moment she finally accepts that things were not going according to plan and that her life might actually be in danger. And only after she had agreed and her body had begun to change did the voices let her know that she was now in servitude to them. Before Ashara's memory becomes available to us, we were generally led to believe that Ashara and her Naga remained servants of the old gods, beholden to them, perhaps even under their total control. Ashara made the pact to save her own skin, but damned herself and her people to lives as monsters in service of the Void. But Ashara, through her memory, lets us know that this wasn't what happened. Ashara negotiated herself a position where she would work with Nazoth, but retain her mind, sovereignty over herself, and control over her transformed subjects. Is the memory an addition to the original story, or a retcon? I would suggest that the beginning of Ashara's memory is somewhat of a fabrication, her standing out in the streets rather than in the palace, struggling against the waters until her ward breaks. It's cinematic but makes no sense why she was outside alone, rather than waiting for Sargeras' imminent arrival. This version of events also paints her out to be much more heroic, actively defending the people and the Empire against an outcome she didn't agree to, and deletes the bit where she was sat in the palace refusing to pay attention to what was going on and drinking wine. The conversation with Nazoth, if we take it to be a true account, could well have happened all within her mind as she sat in her palace holding the ward, 
the author, along with the visions of destruction, wailing of the corpses, and of the Black Empire, could have been presented to her immediately, the moment she accepted she was about to die, lasting mere seconds in real-world time, and the pact sealed with her silent nod. Nazoth has this kind of telepathic power, and this would explain how Ashara in the novels seemingly agreed to accept the deal so quickly. Another error with the memory is that Ashara's weapon, Sharistal, Scepter of Tides, is absent. The jeweled scepter was beloved by Ashara, and she was said to carry it always. Sharistal finds its way into the hands of a shaman hero during the Third Legion invasion, and the law book accompanying it gives us another account of the scene. Ashara watched events unfold from her broken palace. She refused to believe that her dreams of paradise were dead, that the world she had once cradled in her palms was coming apart beneath her feet. Many of the highborn were just as delusional as the queen, and they remained at her side. As the ocean roared in to fill the void left by the destroyed Well of Eternity, Ashara raised Sharistal high. She wove a magical shield around herself and the highborn, saving them from being crushed by the colossal waves, but it was only a momentary reprieve. The howling ocean soon swallowed the queen, Sharistal, and her followers, then it sucked them down and down into darkness. This account is consistent with the narrative in the novels, while the use of the scepter to cast the ward was never mentioned in the book, both accounts see Ashara in the palace as the sea rages in. In a fragment of the Song of Scales, Ashara is said to have then used Sharistal to desperately grant light and warmth to her drowning highborn, though she failed to grant them air. It was after this that the ancient creatures stirred in the darkness, and their powers wrapped tight around the queen and her servants. Sharistal's existence was established before Ashara granted us her memory, but, rather than take its absence as an oversight, I place it as more evidence that the memory was not an accurate account of what actually happened, but only as Ashara remembers it happening, and then edited into a version that she preferred us to see. Maybe, since Ashara gave her scepter to her sea witches, and the aforementioned shaman hero killed the sea witches and stole the scepter, she didn't want to bring it up. She will recognise the weapon, and react angrily to you if you wield it in front of her. The important takeaway here is that Ashara never lost herself when she became an agent of Nazoth, and is unlikely to ever want to serve under anyone or anything. When the Warcraft games begin, Queen Ashara has been hidden for 10,000 years, scheming, building, and growing in power. She possessed a power that few could rival in her elven body, before being twisted into a greater and darker form. Emboldened by the powers of an old god, expanded with hate and rage, and ruling a vast underwater empire of ever-loyal, magically adept, sycophantic monsters. The city had sunk into the depths to birth a new horror, but the details of what was actually happening, what she was doing and what she had become, remained a great mystery, hidden fathoms under the sea until the time of her emergence. 